is I'm going to start today's session with a with a war story, right? Okay. Now, what I was going to tell you guys was the, the guy that was driving his truck, he comes to me and he says, whenever I'm driving my truck and I'm pulling up to a stop, uh, I'm hearing scrub, 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 scrub until I hit the brakes. And then I'm not hearing scrub, scrub, scrub anymore. I hit the brakes, the scrub, scrub stops. But whenever I'm just driving along without my foot on the brake, I'm hearing scrub, scrub, scrub. And he says it's loud enough to where people that happen to be standing close by on the sidewalk watch me pull up because they want to know what that noise is. Oh, man, the brakes. And so, well, that's a, huh? The brakes are loud, essentially. They are, but they're really, you know, they're supposed to be basically not touching them. They're wore thin and they got the little spoiler. Okay, so here's what he did was, he took it to a place that does tires and brakes and all that kind of stuff. And so they threw us at a brakes on there. And it was okay for about a day, and then all of a sudden he's getting scrub, scrub, scrub again. So he goes back, and I don't know if they machined the rotors first time or not, they may have, but anyway, he got his scrub, scrub, scrub back. And then he goes to uh, back over there, and he says, I'm, I'm scrubbing again, what's up with this, you know? We done, we done machined the rotors and put brake pads on there, and I paid you $150 or whatever it was. And so then they decided we needed to put rotors on it. So they put rotors on it. And it's, and well, and whatever. I mean, whatever they did, they put new rotors and brakes, whatever. And it's still scrub, scrub, scrubbing. Last about two days that time. Scrub, 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 come back. And it's going when he's pulling up on the left is front. Is it eating the pads off? No. Not eating the pads off. They look just fine. But it's making that racket. And so I had a guy in here at the time that was a uh, Ray, is what his name was. And I said, Ray, what do you think we need to do this? It's a four wheel drive truck, you know. And he says, uh, and Ray's pretty smart. He had a pretty good head on his shoulders for mechanical stuff. And Ray says, why don't we take it over there and put it on that lift in the other shop? And why don't we take the wheels off? And why don't we put it in four wheel drive and drive it? Because we heard it doing the scrubbing. And let's just see what we see. And I said, well, that sounds like a good idea to me, you know, because if you can get it to make the noise and you can see or feel it and have your hand on it, you know, like I told you guys to go turn the wheels on my Taurus and you can put your finger on the spring and feel that, that funky racket. Were you in on that deal? All right. So watch this video here. That's a dial indicator. the rotors, they've already replaced the brakes, we've got this racket, and we've got, what do you call that? What do you call what you just saw? Lateral run out. When somebody's talking about lateral run out, that's when the rotor's doing this. You got me? Lateral run out. So, what's radial run out? Somebody tell me what radial run out is. What if you had a tire, and you were thinking a tire is a little out around, like it's kind of egg shaped? That's radial run out. That's what that is. So lateral run out is when it's doing side to side. Think about your football, you know, lateral sideways. So you're basically going to do that. All right. Now then. Now, somebody give me a notion of what you think might be wrong with it. Little bearings. Huh? Little bearings. Pretty darn close. I see when it's moving, I'm going to play that again. When it's moving back and forth, see, I got up here so you can kind of get a get a look at it. See on the top, and that's what we saw when we got up there. All right, let me kill that video. And see it moving. See what it's doing. That's what his scrubbing was. We'd found out what his scrubbing was. All right. Now let me see if I can find the video I'm looking for. I may not. No, that's another one I had. Let me go up here. I may be able to just pull it up with a preview. That's where the problem was right there. When you see this, that's the hub the rotor goes onto, isn't it? I don't know how that got bent, but that's what the whole problem was. It was $180 to replace that. But the simple fact was, when we put this dial indicator on there and we turned this through, we saw 
I'll let you run out right there. And then we checked it again with the new rotor. See, there's the new one. See that? Not the new rotor, but the new boat. Do I have to put a new rotor on it again? No. We left the rotor alone because there was nothing wrong with the rotor. I didn't know if it might Yeah. And then after we put after we changed it out, all of that run out was gone. That's a picture of the truck right there. You got that? Everybody clear with that, right? All right, so there's, there's our pictures there. All right, I'm always clicking out of that. I need to get back in it. Not necessarily. Watch this. What we're looking at here, noise and vibration. Now, this is a public domain thing I got from Ford Motor Company many years ago. It's pretty good stuff. There's a lot of different front and rear brake noises and vibrations that you can hear about. You hear me tell about the lady that had the... Uh, that I told the other day that had parked her uh, little Mazda and it had, had rust on the rotors under the pads and all that. You know, being able to track that stuff down is really important. This was an unusual brake noise uh, that he was having. It, when it went away when he mashed the brakes is because it was basically, it wasn't scrubbing, it was just stopping the truck. Now some noises and brake noises, what causes the brakes to squeal? Huh? Vibration? Well, Sort of. What's that? What's actually? What's that squealing noise coming from? Sometimes it could be a little piece of metal getting hard. Yeah, but if you got good pads on it, I mean that ain't got the metal ain't nowhere near it. Sometimes they get hard. They get real hot. They get hard. What do you do about that? You put brakes on somebody's car, right? You know the brake pads, and they come back and they say my brakes are squealing. And you look at them and the brake pads aren't that old. And you machine the rotors maybe. And it doesn't pulsate or nothing, but you're they're squealing. They don't like to listen to that. Take, put the brakes on nice and run a file across them. You can do that, but then what happens if they start squealing again? <laughs> Believe me, I've been there, man. As a dealership, they would come back and they would say, These brakes are squealing. You know, and so what happens is the guy that's in charge, whoever he happens to be, has got to put some kind of a spin on it. And he said, a lot of times brakes squeal, some of them squeal worse than others. You know, I mean, we worried and worried and worried with that. Uh, now, they make this stuff. Have you ever taken a pair of disc pads? Everybody in here put on brake pads, right? They make some, like, yellow stuff. To get the it. stuff you put on the back of the pad, not between the pad and the rotor, but on the back of the pad. What does that do? How the heck does that keep it from squealing? I don't know. It probably absorbs the vibration. Well, you basically, uh, whenever the pad is doing the squealing, it's transmitted through the backing plate into the caliper, and the squealing is actually coming from the caliper, which has always seemed weird to me, because I don't know how a caliper can squeal. But I do know that when you put that stuff on there, it seems to make a difference, right? All right, everybody also understands the, the importance of calipers floating. You know what I mean? You know those little uh, accordion bolt things that, are, that the caliper mounts are screwed into? So that whenever, as the pads wear, the caliper is able to adjust itself so that you're constantly putting uh, pressure on both sides. If one of those is froze up, you'll have a pad that's worn like a wedge. You ever seen that? Pull the brakes off the pad and the caliper worn like a wedge shaped thing. Or what's worse is you'll look at the outside pad through the spokes on the wheel and it's fine. But if you look at the inside, it's worn all the way down to the rotor. You see? Now the squealing, you can help mitigate that by using these ceramic pads. And ceramic pads don't cost that much anymore. But they're still only like one or two percent ceramic. You don't have cer ceramic pads are not totally made out of a coffee cup material. Okay, I mean they've just got a little bit of ceramic mixed with this aramid stuff or whatever they're doing. But the old semi-metallic pads that had all of these metal fibers in them had a tendency to squeal bad, pretty bad. You know, because that that metal would transmit all that stuff. If you put the pads on that don't have the metal fibers in them, then they won't last very long <laughs> and they wear out. Depends on what kind of driving you're going to be doing. Uh, you need to know how the customer drives a car, though, so you'll know which pads to put on there. Furthermore, uh, what kind would you put on there if you don't want to dust up the wheels? Anybody know? The ceramic ones won't dust up the wheels, supposedly. I bought ceramic ones for my F-150. I don't know what the deal was, but it still dusts up the wheels bad as always did. But usually, though, they won't dust up the wheels if you do the ceramic. However, here's another thing. Everybody in here has taken, uh, well, I say not everybody in here. Uh, who has used the machine across the road over there to machine rotors? Okay. First, you're going to 
mount the thing up on the machine. What do you do? You're going to make sure that there's not any rust or bumps on the inside or the outside of the flange surface, right? Because you can mount that thing up right. Somebody, one time years ago, Joey brought his dad's pickup in here, and his dad's passed away now. But it was a Ford pickup his dad had, and somebody mounted that thing up there, and they machined the rotors, but they didn't have them mounted true. Now, what are you actually doing when you true the rotors up? What are you truing them to? Anybody ever think about that? The lock where? You're truing the rotor to the flange. You know the flange you just saw in that video? The flange surface of that rotor, where it goes up against that flange, has got to be smooth <coughs> and clean. Well, they put one in there that wasn't smooth and clean. Actually, you're supposed to mark one of the, the uh, make a mark on one of the lug studs and make a mark on the rotor so you'll put it back on there the same way to prevent you from having trouble. When they got through machining his, it looked really good. You could hold that rotor in your hand. It looked like a brand new rotor. But they, whenever they machined it, the rotor was actually had a bunch of lateral run out. And whenever you hit the brake on that thing, it would start going all over the room because they didn't actually clean up the surface. That was an extreme case of it. Simple fact is that sanding uh, pad that's over on that drill, if you do it upright, and I don't know if anybody's been doing it, you're supposed to clean the inside and the outside of that flange surface where your lug, lug studs go through, right? Everybody do, has everybody been doing that? Have everybody always done that? Clean those. Put them in there, you do your machine, right? And according to, like I say, I was telling him according to AMCO, uh, you can make a 10,000 cup and it'll cut and it'll run the bits cooler than it will if you're making a 2,000 cut because it carries the heat out with the filings, I guess, or whatever. That seems strange to me and counterintuitive, but the long and the short of it is, after you've machined them, what do you do? You've got a pretty smooth rotor on there. Now, there's a reason why you don't need to do this next step on the one that we got on the car because it actually has got a, you know, the feature of making that unnecessary. But you take your sanding pad while the rotor's still spinning and you hold it up against the rotor and you make a non-directional cut. Now, that sanding pad's going to do all that. All right, next step. Somebody give me the next step. After you get the rotor off in your hand, what do you do next? If you're going to do it right, according to Bendix and the brake experts, what do you do next? Huh? Wash the dead. Wash the dead gum thing. Spray some 409 on it and hit it with water hose and wash it off. That'll help with your squeaking because you won't have filings down in them. You can keep wiping that thing with a rag. And you know the best thing to clean cast iron and machine and stuff with is water and soap. If you're going to scrub an engine block or if you're going to do hone cylinders, what do you use to hone those cylinders with? What do you spray in there while you're honing the cylinders? 409. Huh? 409. 409 is what we use. We use soap and water, man. Soap and water is what you use because if you don't, if you use anything else, you can wipe that thing to your blue in the face. You're still going to keep getting filings out of it. That's a crummy deal, isn't it? We're not going to play that. But wash the rotors. And when, if you do a good job machining that rotor, you should be able to take a ballpoint pen after it's dried off and write your name on it. Did you know that? If you did a good job, you should be able to write your name on it with a ballpoint pen and it shouldn't have any skips in it. So next time you do a rotor with that machine over there, make sure you write the ballpoint pen. You know, all the steps I'm talking about. Remember what I said now. Also, you got to put your, on this one over here, the one that we're doing on the car, you don't have to put the silencing ring on it. The one over there you do. Also, make sure that the screws are tight on your little cutting bits when you're doing that one over there. Those little triangular cutting bits, if the screws aren't tight, it causes all kinds of problems. You remember the one the other day that had the big, you know, the deep fluted grooves in it when he did it? And, uh, you know, you better get used to that because you'll get a chance to do a lot of you know, this kind of thing. Rotor turning, brakes, most, most common thing you're going to have to do. Get good at brakes because you're going to be, and, and that's rear and front. Uh, the late model Chevrolet trucks now have got drum brakes again on the rear and some of the other ones. You know, anybody that thought drum brakes were going away, that's nonsense. You know, the, the drum brakes are coming back. And, uh, but anyway, long and short of it, I was going to tell you this. Um, whenever you're working on the rear brakes, on uh, one of these Chevy pickup trucks that does have disc brakes on the rear, Inside, on the, uh, I mean, inside the, the hat where the park brakes are, uh, you, a lot of times you're going to need to replace that park brake shoes. You ever do that? You ever replace the park brake shoes on one? So those Chevys are like that. And I'm going to have you guys, uh, we got to get that green GMC in here, you know, and get it running. I'm probably going to have some of you guys slam a fuel pump on it uh, because I got one in there for it. I've had that for a long time. But anyway. Uh, you pull them things off, you need to know how to change those things too. I mean, the, 
that one's in the hat. Now, who knows how, if you don't have the, the brake brake shoes in the hat, how do you, how do the power, park brakes work? Anybody know that? You've seen that on your, you'll see that on your, on your interactive setup here. Uh, you basically have got that little caliper piston, it's got a screw in the middle of it. And as the pads wear, it screws it farther and farther out. But in order to do your park brake, when you do your park brake, there's some little dimples, balls that are sitting in dimples. And whenever you operate that park brake, it rolls those balls up on those dimples and pinches the rotor. Now the difference between those and the ones on the front, who's actually done the brakes on the rear and had to use a special tool to screw the rotor, I mean to screw the thing back in, you had to do that before? That's because of those funky uh, brakes, you know, the one that screws out and has a little ball dimples, Ford 500 out there that Michelle Goosby drives. Got, brakes, huh? brakes. Brakes, yeah. What's that now? A little no, no. This thing I'm talking about is basically uh, I'm talking about for the if you got disc brakes that are doing your the job of the park brake. If if your if your disc brakes are doing the job of your park brake, you're going to have one that screws. I mean a, a caliper piston that screws out there, and you got to screw it back in with a special tool in order to do that. I mean, if you never, and you never understand how, why you had to do that, you know, you basically you'll see a cutaway in there. Uh, but when you're looking for brake noise, one of the very first things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to verify the complaint. Now, this is what Brian was doing on that noise he was doing this morning was verifying the complaint. The guy was claiming, you know, he had problems uh, with, ever, with his uh, ball joint. Well, ball joints squeak really bad if they're dry and if the boots are busted. And so he didn't tell me he was having problems with it when he was going over bumps. He said he was having problems, indicated he was having problems when he was turning, loss of communication or something. But look at this right here. See this right here? Look at this little thing right here. The chrome fade performance fiction coefficient. This is, they're talking about Ford brake material, but everybody's brake material has got to have all of these characteristics right here. Can you see the little, um, this little triangle over here? Got to have durability, performance, and then this right here, look at your noise. A clicking noise during ABS stops is not a problem. You got me? You ever heard that? Have you ever felt your ABS working? Yep. Okay, here's another little war story. Um, Thunderbird, uh, driving along, you hit the brake, the ABS kicks in, it won't let you stop the car, you go right through a red light. Scare you to death. You wanna drive one like that? Without warning, all right? So what the problem was, the ring that they had on that particular, uh, it was an old Thunderbird in the early 90s, and it had a, a ring for the ABS sensor. The ABS sensor is telling it what the wheel speeds are. One of the wheel speeds stops. If the one of the wheels stops, it shuts off the brake pressure to that wheel, right? Uh, and <coughs> and it, you know, it don't want you to slide the wheels because when you slide the wheels, you can't control the car and it just goes straight when you turn and all this stuff. It thought a wheel was sliding because that ring got loose on that collar and just stopped in spite of the fact that the wheel was still rolling. So that needs a rotor. So. This guy was talking about when it was doing exactly that same thing when I was at Larry's Barbecue over there having lunch, and I said, that's a Lincoln. And I said, they'll, they'll probably be working on that Lincoln place. I think he'd already been going to the Lincoln place for other things. And I said, you go up there and tell them to replace the brake rotor, whatever it was, I think it was on the brake rotor, because that little ring has come loose up there in there. And so he goes up there to the, to the dealership, and that Lincoln dealership's closed now. But anyway, he says uh, they put uh, a booster on it, and they put a master cylinder, and they put, I don't know, two or three or four hundred dollars worth of parts on it trying to fix that before they realized that that thing had <laughs> come loose. And I told him that to start with, you know, and when they finally put the rotor on it, it took care of it. Uh, but ABS is an interesting thing because it won't be the same on a, on a pickup truck or a Jeep. I used to work on these Jeeps, and I would want to check and see if the brakes would work, uh, the ABS part would work, and I'd stand on the brake on a dirt road to make, after I worked on the ABS, I wanted to make sure that they wouldn't like lock up the wheels, you know. And uh, the Jeep would go whoop, 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 like a bucking bronco is basically what it would do. But when you're driving something like a little sports car, like one time I was driving a little Ford Probe, which is not really a sports car, but it's a sporty car. 
I drove down the road on a wet road where there was nobody else out there and it was raining a little bit and I'd been working on that and I said I need to see if these ABS will work because I don't know what this guy's going to be doing. So I got up to about 60 something miles an hour and I stood on the brake as hard as I could to see if it would slide and it stopped like it was on dry pavement. You couldn't feel the brake pedal pulsing or anything. So there's a whole bunch of different types of anti-lock brake systems. Now the sensors on that little small car I was driving it was like $200 a piece. It only cost a fraction of that on the other. Anyway, I'm going to hit you another couple of those. Morning squeal. Doesn't affect brake performance or safety. Can be caused by humidity and low rotor pad temperature and pad temperature. And once they're applied, the rotor pad warms up and the noise will go away. You know, if you can't duplicate the condition after it's driven to the shop or the dealership, uh, you know, there's not any use in working on that. Some of the times you just got to tell people. Now, the grown. What you got here, have you ever heard the brake groan? If the pads are good and you're sitting here and you're letting it creep forward a little bit, you'll hear it go, Rrr. you ever heard that? The brake, you ever heard that grunt noise? You ever heard it? Yeah, you will. That doesn't mean there's a problem with it, right? That doesn't affect it. May occur if it stops and the driver slowly releases the brake pedal, lets it creep forward while the brakes are still pretty tight against the rotor. Not usually noticeable in a vehicle equipped with a manual transmission, though. Ordinarily automatic transmission. Okay, wire brush noise. That's light breakage during early vehicle mileage driving. You know, this is like a brand new car. Before the friction surfaces are burnished or broken in. Now, how many of you know how to break in a set of brakes? How do you do that? All right, that wasn't the answer I was looking for. Okay, the 30-30-30 method is how you're supposed to do that. 30 stops from 30 miles an hour with 30 second cool down. Can you do that? Normal stops, now don't, not panic stops. 30 stops from 30 miles an hour with 30 second cool down. That's what Bendix recommends. So you try to get 30 miles an hour, you do a normal stop, let it cool down, take off, do it again. After you do that, how many of you have noticed, and you noticed it the other day, when you put brand new brakes on one all the way around, the pedal doesn't feel as firm as it did, does it? You notice that? It feels different, doesn't it? I mean, you know what I mean? It feels basically like you've got a soft pedal. And he was really worried sick about that thing because the pedal was so soft. But part of the soft pedal was because the brake pads were new. You know, that line, is, you know, you can't match it with your hand, but you're putting thousands of pounds of pressure on it. Once it glazes in a little bit, you're okay. All right. So this, is, this does not, I mean, the dune indicated need for service got a grinding noise. What did you hear on Nermy's truck the other day? Who's involved with Nermy's truck when the brake pad had worn the rotor slam out to where it was paper thin on one side? He's not here. Huh? Yeah. Continuous squeal. That's like your little sensor read. Some occasional brake squeal may be normal. Shoe clack. All right. So let me tell you something else. One of the things you need to be aware of when you're pulling, say you put rear brakes on one that's got drum brakes on it, like the Bronco or something. If you don't adjust those brake shoes out really close to the drum, it's going to feel like there's air in it. You're going to hit it once, it's going to go down, you're going to hit it again, it's going to be on the top. Because the first pump is moving the shoes out a little, and the second pump moves them out and they finally hit the drum. So what you got to do if you want a good solid brake feel, and this is like on any of them, like on, I think my Taurus has got rear drum brakes, I believe. You know, goofy me, I don't even know what my car's got on it because I ain't had to work on it. But the long and the short of it is, uh, on some of the Tauruses that I know that led up to my Taurus, they did have drums on them. And if you don't have those brakes adjusted right, that pedal's not going to feel right no matter what you do. So you got to adjust those out, not tight enough to where they're going to be holding it where it can't go, but tight enough to where they don't have to move hardly at all before they touch it. That's extremely important. Putting all the springs and everything on there good, uh, right is one good thing, but make doggone sure you adjust them out to where they're good and snug against the drum, but not enough to where they're actually slowing the drum down or getting hot. Okay. Okay, so brake roughness is felt in the seat, steering wheel, or brake pedal. You ever felt it in the seat? You ever felt it in the steering wheel? Well, you feel a steering wheel when you hit the brake? Yeah, right, brake roughness on that right there. Okay, what about normal, what's normal or pedal, plus, I mean, normal operation or pedal pulsation that a customer may be concerned about? I said it earlier. Huh? ABS is going to do that when you're getting on it. Here's another thing. If you got a vehicle on the lift, like one of our pickups that we got out here, and you spin it up and you hit the brakes, 
that don't think they've stopped because they may not have. Have you ever put a vehicle in park when the wheels were going? No. Who's done that? <laughs> I'm talking about on the lift. What does it sound like? Thunk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And why did it do that? A lot of the time it's because the anti-lock brakes, the rear anti-lock brakes, if it's got rabs on it like the Ranger or that, it's going to stop the rear, I mean, it's going to keep the rear wheels from coming to a stop, you know, suddenly. And you'll think you've stopped them because you've hit your foot on a brake, and then when you throw it in there, you know, the park ball's bouncing like here and there. So, but anyway, this one right here. All right, what we're going to do, uh, we'll cover some of this stuff, not right now, but a little bit later. But you got pulsation in the brake pedal caused by hypothalamic pump motor, but that's ABS stuff. And you got a feeling in panic conditions, loose gravel, tires are unloaded, or a wet and snowy road. ABS system is bouncing things on there. So, but anyway, I got another couple of, uh, I've got another 66, no, 60, 59 pages of this to go, uh, but we're not going to do this today because we don't have time before lunch. But I will, uh,